In this Godot multiplayer tutorial, I'll teach you how you can make sure that all the animations in the game world from every single player and projectile are visible for all the players. Let's get started. So let's first work on that idle and walk animations and we'll leave the attack and the ice spears for just a moment from now. I'm right here on the client project and I'm on the player script, the player that you're controlling. In a previous tutorial, we already created this function define player state, the player state which is then sent off to the game server 60 times per second. We already had the timestamp and the player position and I've now added the A for animation vector. The animation vector is going to help us determine which animation we needs to be playing, northwest, southeast or top, bottom, left, right, however you've called your animations. One note to take here is I've changed the operating system time into the synchronized client clock. This is not important for this tutorial or the code thus far in this entire series, but it will become important once we start moving the physics to the server in the next couple of tutorials. So with that said, let's get into this animation vector. How do we get it and how do we use it? For the animation vector, I have first defined it on the top of the script as a vector2. To determine that animation vector, we actually already have the code available to us, we just need to make a couple of slight changes. Right here on line number 31 and 32, we're setting the blend position of the animation tree, which helps the animation tree pick the right animation direction. The input for the blend position, and let me make this a little bit bigger, is actually a normalized vector, perfect for what we need for our animation vector. So, instead of these two lines and calculating that animation vector inside this, uh, these functions, I'm simply going to be first determining the animation vector as that same piece of code, and then we'll push the animation vector into the animation tree that makes the code more readable and it makes that the engine doesn't have to recalculate these vectors. Now, on every time that is action is pressed attack, we are not only setting the correct animation for this player, but we're also going to be pushing the animation vector into our player state so we can display this animation for any other player that sees this player on the screen. Now, of course, this is only for attack, so I've done exactly the same in the movement loop, which is called on every single delta frame in the physics process engine. Right here, we had the two lines for the animation tree, which used to have, instead of the animation vector, movement normalized. Now, I've also added the extra line of code by defining the animation vector first so that it can be pushed into the player state that is then being sent off to the server. Now, as these player states are going to be sent off to the server, the server is not going to do anything with them. We're not playing any animations on the server. That will be a waste of resources. So the player states are simply going to go into the world state as we've done before. And all the world states are going to come back to all the players so that all the players have the correct animation vector, which, which they can show the correct animations for any other player that they see on the screen. So let's go into that piece of code now. For every other player, let's first have a look at where we are processing that world state. We do that on our map script within the physics process function, where we do all our interpolation and extrapolation of both enemies and players. For every player, we were in previous tutorials already defining the new position and pushing that new position into the move player function of that other player. Now, on top of that, we are also distilling the animation vector out of the world state and we'll push that animation vector to the move player function as well. Now we can switch to the player template and see how we are using that new animation vector. On this script, there is a lot of new code as previously this only used to be two lines of code. It used to be move player function with a set position. Now we got a couple of variables here on the top that I'll skip over as those have to do with attacking and ice spears and we'll start here on line number seven. First we have to define the animation tree and the playback parameter within the animation tree as the animation mode. Those are two lines of code that are also existing on the player script as they come straight out of that tutorial that I mentioned earlier about the animation tree. Now, keep in mind that I've made a one-on-one -on -one copy of the node tree for our other player. That means that my node tree is exactly the same as the original player. That also means I have the same animation player with all the animations and the same animation tree that governs the behavior of those animations. So we're gonna be making use of very similar code as we had on our player. Every time that move player is being called, which happens 20 times per second as it happens on every time that a world state is being processed, we're going to push that animation vector into the blend position of the animation tree. 
Now the only thing that's left to do is determine when are we idle and when are we walking. For that we can make use of the new position that's being sent and we can compare that to the current position of this player. If they are exactly the same that means that the player must have been idling and we can travel to the idle animation. If that is not the case and the positions are different then we can travel to the walking animation. If we are walking and if that position is indeed different that's of course the moment that we have to set the position to the new position as we previously did in previous tutorials. Now on to the fun stuff, attacking and projectiles. I'm going to start on a player script under our function unhandled input. Is action pressed attack, we are running the attack function. There's nothing new here, this has all been in place since episode number one. Under the attack function, we have the code that we had previously already, which instances in an iSpear for this client. Now of course we want this iSpear to also instance on all the other clients and for that we have this extra line of code game server send attack with the position of this player and the animation vector. Now there's an important question to answer here and that is why do we not put this attack in the player state? If we were to put this in the player state we're going to have to be adding a couple of variables to the player state. Something like we are attacking and maybe what skill name or what weapon we are using. If we were to do that, we are increasing the size of the packet that is being sent to the server 60 times per second. Now ask yourself, are you attacking 60 times per second? Even in a hack and slash kind of game, you have to be moving from enemy group to enemy group. You got your cooldown time for your skills, you got your attack speed for your weapons. In a shooter kind of game like a battle royale, PUBG, you are most of the times busy with looting and moving and positioning. You don't actually pull the trigger that often. If we were to increase the size of the packet that's being sent to the server 60 times per second with empty variables because we're not attacking in that moment, we're just having variables which are dead weight in all of those packets. We're just gonna increase our network bandwidth usage. That's basically gonna make our players unhappy plus once the player state arrives on the server, the server has to be doing a check with probably an if function if there's actually an attack in that player state. It has to be doing that check 60 times per second for every single player. In other words, we're going to be burdening the server with doing a lot of if checks with most of the times will be invalid or not true. So we're basically using a lot of server power for nothing. So instead of burdening the network and instead of burdening the server with all those requirements, we're just going to be sending this attack straight off to the server so we only need to use the network bandwidth for the attack we're actually doing and we only use server capacity the moment an attack actually happens. Enough of the talking, let's get coding again. We tell the game server to send the attack. Switching to that script on send attack, we receive those two variables, we're going to call the server, we send those two variables to the server and a third variable which is the client clock. That's the timestamp that this attack happened. We need that timestamp so that all the other clients will know at which precise time they need to be displaying the animation and instancing the ice spear. Switching to the server that's going to receive this call is going to receive that remote function call attack. It receives those three variables. It determines the player that made the attack by determining the player ID. It's then going to RPC call every single peer in the network indicated by that zero there. And it's going to return those four variables to the function call receive attack. Switching back to the client on receive attack, we first have to determine if the player ID determined by the server is equal to the network unique ID of this client. If that is the case, it means that this is the client that made the attack in the first place. It's its own attack, in which case we want, of course, want to skip this one. Otherwise, it means that it is another player's attack, in which case we're going to get the note of that particular player using that player ID again, and we're going to be adding this attack to the attack dictionary on that player template script. On the attack dictionary, we're going to be making use of the client clock that is now defined as spawn time as the dictionary key, and we add the position and the animation vector, oh, the animation vector, as uh, elements of that key. So now we can switch back to the player template where we had a couple more lines of code that I needed to explain to you. First of all, these three on the top. It's a good time to talk about these. We have the iSpear, which is a preloaded scene of the iSpear. We have the attack dictionary that starts out empty, but as you just saw, we're going to fill that one up. And we have the state. That's going to be important to handling our animations. Now you might be wondering, why are we adding this attack to a dictionary and why don't we process it immediately? There's a timestamp on that attack. 
And it might be the case as this client is rendered 100 milliseconds in the past for interpolation that the attack is actually, once the client receives it, still an attack that needs to be happening in the future. So we may not want to display that attack immediately. Therefore, we're first saving it. Then under the physics process delta function, we're going to be checking if the attack dictionary is not empty, in which case we want to run the function attack. On our attack function, and let me make this a little bit bigger, we're going to go over every attack within the attack dictionary keys. Remember those keys were timestamps so we can check that attack against the client clock on the game server. And if that attack is smaller or equal to that client clock, we know that time has passed along far enough that we can now instance in this eye spear and do the attack animation. Let's first do the animation of the actual character. We are setting the state to attack, and I'll get back to that state in a moment. We're going to set the blend position of the cast animation within that animation tree to the animation vector that was received by the attack. We are gonna travel to that cast animation and we're gonna set the position of this player to the position that was communicated in this attack. We have to set this position on top of the set position we already do in move player because there might be, through to interpolation and extrapolation, a very small deviation. And if there's a very small deviation, it might look like the ice spear doesn't come out of the hands of the player, but might come out of the arm. Or if you've got a spaceship with guns, the, the, the bullet's not going to come out of the muzzle of the guns, but are going to come out of the spaceship hull, or same case with uh, a shooter. So we don't want any of those weird glitches or artifacts. So by heart positioning the player based on the position that was communicated by the original client that made the attack, we can make sure that those animations and those instances of the bullets or projectiles are lining up exactly. So once we've got that done, we can now instance in the eye spear and we use this code here. This code is very similar, as you can see, to the code of the original player where instancing the ice spear. The only difference is that the player is using the get global mouse position on a number of occasions. And of course, we don't have access to the mouse location of the client that is somewhere else in the world. So instead of that, we're gonna use that animation vector. So have a quick look at this code, pause it if you have to, and have a look at this code where we use the animation vector in a couple of instances positive you have to and write over the code make the small adjustments that are necessary now what about those states now as you have seen i'm setting the state to attack at the start of the attack and back to idle at the end that makes sure that for the 400 milliseconds that this animation lasts our state is in the attack mode if we were to continue the code as is 50 milliseconds later, a new world state is gonna come in and this move player function is gonna be called, which is gonna set the animation mode to either travel to idle or travel to walk. We don't want that. We want that animation to stay on attack as long as that animation needs to be happening. So I'm gonna make a small adjustment to the code here on move player, we're first gonna check if the state is not attack, and only if it's not attack, we're gonna allow the code to run. On top of that, I've set the states here to idle and walk for the idle and walk moments. We're not really doing anything with idle or walk states, but this could be the start of the implementation of a finite state machine within this other player script. Now there's one last change we need to make to make this code fully functional, and I can show you a demonstration. On line number 40, we got iSpear instance original false. And we only have this line of code for any iSpear that is instanced when it originates from another player and not the actual player that you're controlling. The original is a new variable on the iSpear script with a default value of true. So that means that original will only remain true for the iSpear which actually originates from the player that's being controlled. Now, on iSphere body entered, we can not only check for is in group enemies, which we did originally since episode number one, but we can also check if original is true. This is the original iSphere of the original caster. Only in that case, we're going to run the onHit function on the body that was hit, in this case, a werebear. If we were not to implement these changes, then every single client that witnesses that iSphere hitting that werebear is going to hit the onHit function. In other words, the amount of hits the werebat takes is going to be equal to the amount of players on the map. That is, of course, completely undesirable. So we need to make sure that no on-hit functions are being called for any instances of ice spears that originate from other players. Now, all that's left for me is to give you a quick demonstration. As you can see, I'm moving around on my client on the left side, and the client on the right side is displaying this other player with all the correct animations, both walking 
and idling. And when I shoot an ice spear, the ice spear is instanced on both sides, both clients, and of course, we can still, most importantly, kill ourselves some weird ass. That was it for today, guys. Hope you like it. If you did, smash that like button, hit subscribe. Don't forget that little bell icon to make sure that you don't miss out on the next tutorial in this multiplayer series. In the next tutorial, we're going to be having a look at moving the physics from the client to the server. Currently, the client is still doing the hit detection for when the wearer actually needs to receive a hit. That is very exploit sensitive and we won't want our players to be able to exploit. So by moving our physics to the server, we're going to be making sure that our clients cannot exploit and we get more fair and equal gameplay. Get ready for that one. And until then, keep on gaming, keep on coding. See you later, guys.